when I start working in Kabamata and Fairfield area, there's a quite a few high proportion of Vietnamese people who uh, were long-term unemployed. And because I speak the same language, I have the privilege to get into their world and ask them questions and start assessing them. And that's why this, um, I start uh, seeing that it's not that simple and the problem is much more complex than, than we can think of. Well, you're particularly interested in looking at the barriers that some of these people face in gaining employment and why they might be outside not only being employed but life, having a quality of life in Australia. What are some of those barriers? There's all sorts of barriers, but I realise it's with, you know, sitting with them and interviewing them, you know, most of the time they suffer a lot from trauma because they come from war-torn country and have gone through a lot and lots of trauma. And quite a high proportion of these people present symptoms of what we call post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a disorder that affects people who has gone through trauma and torture. And this has a lot, a lot of impact on their ability to go into mainstream employment, go into open and competitive employment. They have real problem, even if they find a job, sometimes they have problem to keep the job because of different symptoms that they presented. It's not that easy to recognize these symptoms. The, 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 the Vietnamese community don't talk that much about that because it's a culturally, that is something very intimate. You don't talk to people about this. And in the Asian community, there's a loss of somatization of the problem, which is not looking at the problem in terms of nightmare or flashback and things, but in terms of physical symptoms such as some um, headaches, stomach ache and all sorts of physical symptoms that you would put into, um, you know, not a post-traumatic stress disorder really. So they actually have physical symptoms where they feel physically ill but there's nothing really physically wrong with them. It's a psychosomatic disorder. Yeah, it is, it is. And uh, I've interviewed so many people having headaches and or stomach aches and I always send them to GP first for a complete medical checkup to see if there's any sort of underlying physical problems. And most of the time they come back to me completely clear from the physical symptoms like panic attacks. They don't have a heart problem. Now people with this disorder have quite a difficult time in learning and often they get sent off to English language classes, for example, to learn English. And caseworkers, people working with them, don't understand why they're not able to learn. But you've recognised that this is partly, at least, to do with having traumatic experiences in their past, which are still with them today. That's correct. When I start working, there's a lot of staff from CES come and say to me, listen, we've sent these people to a lot of English classes. They've done the 510 hours with AMES, and when they finish, we send them here and there. And still, even the basic English is really hard for them to learn. And they start asking, you know, why, why? Some of them are universities, some of them have done study in the past and, and, and in their country. They, they were quite successful in their country. That's why I start realizing that post-traumatic stress disorder, when you suffer from these symptoms, your concentration is very, very low and your memories is, has a loss, are impaired by the trauma. The trauma blocked the memory and the ability to concentrate. And this could trigger a whole source of past experience that was so traumatic that you don't have the capacity to process new information. They are dying to do English class, they are dying to learn something, but they can't at that stage of their life. All disability are blocked by the trauma. Tell us about the example of Motif, who you eventually recognised as having post-traumatic stress syndrome, even though he presented with many physical symptoms. Tell us about the example of, of working with him and, and discovering this. Mm -hmm. In fact, when, when he came to me, he... He was very sick. He has all sorts of problems. He coughed to blood. He was very depressed, but he's always say, well, I have headaches all the time. I cough to blood, and I used to stay alone in my room, and I just, you know, wrap myself in my coat and stay there hours and spend, spend lots and lots of time of, with him and start realizing that he has such a traumatic... Uh, he was arrested in Vietnam, put into jail for I don't know how many years, and then he escaped his trip 
from Vietnam to a third country was so traumatic and he kept having all the flashback and all the nightmares. I mean, when I heard about him coughing to blood, I sent him straight away to a doctor's for a medical checkup. He was clear, completely clear. And that's one of the reasons why I start thinking, well, if, if the problem is not there, where is the problem then? And start, you know, sitting with him and assessing him really completely. And I must say that because I speak the language, I got through quite easily. I don't know how it would be difficult for somebody else who don't speak the language um, to get through people like that because they are very withdrawn. And in the Asian community, it's not that easy to tell what you feel. Talking about feeling is a little bit um, not socially acceptable in, in, in some cases, especially when you are men. You know, you don't want to say to people, well, I'm depressed. It's not that socially acceptable. It's an experience, this experience of torture, of imprisonment, of extreme trauma that some of these people have gone through in their, in their past in Vietnam and escaping Vietnam that would be very alien to a lot of Australians here. How difficult do you think it is for your co-workers who aren't coming from your background to, to work with these people and really empathise with that experience, to recognise it? It was quite difficult at first because when these people come to Australia, I would say, OK, you are here, start again your life, we offer you this and that, so you can start your life again. And time passed and you see that they can't start their life again. And you start saying, well, do you really want to start your life again? What's the problem? So, yes, it is difficult for people who don't understand about the problem to accept that, you know, just go ahead with life. But in reality, it's so complex that it's not that easy to just go ahead with your life like that. And I imagine that being unemployed, particularly long-term unemployed, just compounds the problem. Yes, it's compounded the problem terribly. I mean, you, you, you come to see yourself as a complete useless person and your self-esteem is dropping and everything is make your life very difficult. Um, I've seen so many people who say to me, help me, help me to do something. I want to work. Please do something for me. And, and still... If you don't help them in a way that is the appropriate way, if you can just put them in the mainstream services, they will stay there for a while and then they would, you know, drop out again. So, yes, it is very difficult and being long-term unemployed doesn't help at all. Will you describe working with a woman who presented with a very traumatic past to you and the way you helped her through that? Tell us about that process, how after you've recognised someone who has post-traumatic stress disorder in your community, how you go about helping them through that so they can get on with their lives, they can do something like learn English, like hold down a job. Yeah, it was a very interesting experience. I've stayed a lot of time with that young person. She has a very traumatised past coming from Vietnam to here. What we've done is a lot of trauma counselling and then vocational counselling after that, trying to open, widen her options in, in what kind of things she can do in Australia. Then I've tried to put her in some English classes and I have that privilege to have a lot of contact with the providers who organise the English class and explain to them that she has a very short concentration span and all of that. And it was a very good teacher who followed her up. So she learned English. And then after that, at that time, the CES has special program like six months of work experience. We did put her on a work experience on, on, on a program like that. And after that, our feedback that I have was really good. I mean, she, she then can go ahead with her life. Yeah. Her quality of life has changed a lot. In some cases, in dealing with these people who have very traumatic pasts, is it often the case that it's the first time they might have spoken to, to anybody about their experiences? Yes, yes, because they have gone through so many things that you can't say things like that to people. You prefer, you try to forget things and you try to push it away. And this is, we, that's our normal reaction when we go through something that is too painful. We just try to push it away, you know, until you can't push that away anymore. So, yes, most of the time that's the first time that they disclose about different things. But in another way, I have to also educate the Vietnamese community about that as well. 
try to explain and try to take off all the prejudice and stigma that were put on the people seen as mentally ill. They are not mentally ill. They are just at that stage of their life, they are blocked by some trauma, but they are not mentally ill. In our culture, having a person mentally ill in the family, um, in most of the cases, taken as you've done something wrong in your past life, and not only you, but the whole family, your mom, your, you know, your mom, your dad, and so you've done something wrong in your past life, and it's not something that is very agreeable to say to people that you've done something wrong in your past life, and now you're paying for that. So there's a, a big stigma there. So you tend to hide it. You tend not to say it. You tend not to go outside and go to mainstream services and say, well, I have somebody who has that, you know. Can you help? So it's, it's keep inside the family because it's, it's a shame. It's a real shameful thing. What about the effect on the family? Tell us about that. Mm. Oh, that's affected a lot, the person having the trauma. First, the feeling of guilt. I've created all these problems to people around me, so, you know, and it affects your family because some of people choose alcohol, some people go into domestic violence, some people choose gambling as a way of releasing stress and a way of releasing all this trauma that, that, that make your life so painful. Um, so it affects the whole, and then the dynamic of the family changes in a new country. Everything is new, so you have to... Uh, start the whole thing again. You have to accept that your wife has to can go out and work, and and your children are not uh, Vietnamese anymore. They are more Australian, and lots of lots of problem is um, turning around and around on that, and, and it's like a vicious circle. How are you going to get out of there? Hearing these problems that people in your community have, Han, on a day-to-day -day basis, listening to all these past traumas, trying to help people get on with their lives in a new country. How difficult has that been for you? It is very difficult, but um, my profession, I've, I'll be trained to know exactly where I am when I deal with people and I, I try to not be too emotionally involved with that and to be very objective. But, yeah, it is very challenging, and sometimes it is draining. It Do you is. have to have pretty good boundaries yourself? I have to have it in order to protect myself. I have to know what I can do, what are my limits, to what point I must stop, just for self-preservation.